Hello, and welcome to this teaching from Skip Heitzig of Calvary Church. We pray this message strengthens your relationship with the Lord. And if it does, we'd love to hear about it. Email us at mystory@calvaryabq.org. And if you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can give online securely at calvaryabq.org. Being a Christian believer cost Paul a lot. He lost his status and prestige, and he landed in a foreign prison facing possible execution. So what are the benefits of believing in Christ if the world hates you and most people misunderstand you? In the message, Benefits of Being Believers, Skip shares five benefits that offset any loss we might incur. Now please turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter 3 as he begins. Father, um, we ask you to help us. We need your help to understand, to grasp, to glean, uh, especially, Lord, to apply and believe that these things are true. These are benefits that you have given to us. Lord, you know the condition of every heart in this place. Some of us, Lord, come very lighthearted, very joyous, very excited. We have seen blessing after blessing in our life. Uh, For others, that is not the experience. It's been difficult, in some cases even dark. And we need a word of encouragement that would bring us close to you and bolster our confidence, Lord, and your plan for our lives. So, Lord, no matter what is the condition, we look to you for the provision. In Jesus' name, amen. Every one of us makes choices every day. And The way choice works is that we make our choices and then our choices turn around and they make us. They define who we are as people. So that every decision that we make, it counts. You know, it's sort of like flypaper. There's two sides to a piece of flypaper, but it makes a huge difference to the fly which side he chooses to land on. And when believing in Jesus means getting beat up and thrown into prison and being ridiculed and mocked, and when believing in Christ means a loss of freedom, being chased by assassins, having to hide out for your very life, when believing in Jesus means you get pain and sorrow, and it even costs you your life, the question is, why do it? If believing in Christ and following his plan and being surrendered to him could possibly mean you losing everything, why make that choice? What are the benefits from making that kind of a decision? Is there any payoff for that kind of pain? And I bring that up because typically when a person gives up something, they do it to gain something. If a person quits his job, usually it's because he's found a better job. If a person marries someone, it's because they see the benefit of not being alone any longer. If you give something away, it's to replace it with something else. Or you want to get the feeling of that altruistic love or sacrifice, whatever you have made. But let's just say you win the lottery. And it's a $3 million ticket. You won. Somebody comes to your door, knocks on the door, and says, I have a check for $3 million for you. If you were to say, nah, I'm good. I don't need it. I found something better. Well, everybody wants to know what could be better than that. Paul the Apostle made such a choice And he now sees the world very, very differently than how he once saw the world. What was once shiny to Paul is now dull. What was once important to Paul is now unimportant. What was once super cool to be esteemed, to be aspired to, is now rubbish to this apostle. Verse 7 of chapter 3. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish 
that I may gain Christ. That's an incredible statement. The reverse is also true. Those things that he once thought were dull and ordinary and despised, he now values. He says, continuing on in verse 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I venture to say this happened to you at some point in your life. You sort of figured out that all the things you thought were cool and important, they don't taste the same any longer. They don't have the same appeal. Um, everybody who comes to Christ finds their appetites change. It certainly happened to me. Uh, I used to think the last thing I'd ever want to be in life is a Christian. That's what I thought. I thought Christians are boring people who like boring things. For some odd reason, they go to church a lot. I can't figure out why. But then I met Christ, and everything changed. Everything radically changed, the way I looked at life. And so my friends noticed the changes. And they said, hey, Heitzig, you're like different now. You know, we keep inviting you back to the parties. You don't want to party anymore. What's the deal? And I said, look, I don't know how to put it to you guys except just to say, I have something much better. Oh, really? Well, tell us about it. Is it a better drug? I said, well, it is a high, but not like you think. And so when I started explaining what it is to believe in Jesus, you could just see their body language. You've seen it. They're just like, please, stop. Stop right there. And they were trying to figure me out. And I said, look, let me just put it to you this way. The best way I can help you understand, it's like this. I've been eating TV dinners my whole life, and somebody just gave me steak and lobster. It's sort of hard for me to go back to the TV dinners. I've tasted something much better than what I've been feeding on. Some of them got it, most of them didn't. Now it's funny, there are commonplace items, commonplace possessions that suddenly gain value when we discover they have been owned by famous people. So for example, Napoleon's toothbrush sold for $21,000. Would you pay $21,000 for a gnarly used, bacteria-ridden toothbrush? Well, somebody did because it belonged to Napoleon. Hitler's car sold for $150,000. Winston Churchill's false teeth for $20,000. No, thank you. The picture's good. Jackie Onassis's uh, fake pearls, they weren't even real, fake pearls, sold for $211,000. JFK's golf club sold for $772,000. Now what changed the value? Ownership. Source changed the value. It's where they come from that changes the value. So what Paul does here, he says this, I used to think these are gain, now they're loss. I've got something better. Paul assigns value to five areas of life, all of which come from Christ, and hence they're valuable. Those five areas we'll briefly look at today, they are knowledge, position, righteousness, fellowship, and glory. Or to be more specific, the knowledge of Christ, position in Christ, righteousness by Christ, fellowship with Christ, and glory like Christ. Would you uh, go back with me to verse 8? We looked at that last time, but there's a, a particular word that shows a benefit. In verse 8, he speaks of knowledge. Yet indeed, I count all things loss. Why, Paul? Why are you saying no to those things? What could be better than all that you had attained? Here it is. For the excellence of the knowledge 
of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now, do you, do you know that the Bible describes believers as people who know God? That's how the Bible describes us. We know God. I have two books by that name. One is called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Fabulous book. Changed my life. The other book is called Knowing the Face of God by Tim Stafford. Both excellent books. What sold me on them was the title, Knowing God. It describes the Christian life. Jesus himself spoke of this when he said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. When Jesus prayed to the Father in John chapter 17, he said, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The Apostle John tells us this is the whole reason Jesus came. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And Jeremiah the prophet, in predicting the new covenant that we enjoy, said this would be the key element. He said, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Now, all of this language is where we get the notion of having a personal relationship with God. I know God. Years ago, I had a, mail, a mailman, a mail carrier, uh, who brought me mail every day. And and I don't know why, but uh, somebody once asked me, hey, do you, do you know your mailman? And so I started describing him. Well, he's about this tall, has this kind of a build, kind of walks a little funny, usually wears these, you know, gray mailman shorts. And I was describing him, but it dawned on me I'd never met him. I didn't know him. I knew facts about him. And what I was telling my friend when he asked me, do you know him, is I was answering his question with the wrong answer. I, I was saying, well, I know certain attributes about him. But then there came a day when I thought, I'm going to introduce myself to him. I introduced myself to him, got to know a little bit about him, his background, his family. Now I knew him. I've met him. Well, that's how it is so often when it comes to God. You ask somebody, do you know God? And they can spout off or spout out knowledge tidbits. They know certain attributes of God, certain doctrines of God. They tell you a lot about him. They know a lot about him, but they do not know him. Paul the apostle, who used to be Saul of Tarsus, certainly knew a lot about his God, the Jewish God. But it wasn't until the Damascus Road experience when Jesus so abruptly introduced himself to Saul of Tarsus that he began really knowing him. So we have a knowledge, that's a benefit, we know God. Now, this is like the ultimate name drop. You know how people like to drop names? Well, you know, the president of the company, you know, we're, we're friends. Ooh. Or the mayor, yeah, we're really close. We play golf once a week, dropping names. You have the ultimate. You can say, really? I know God. God and I, we're like this. In fact, I just spoke to him this morning. Now, when Paul says knowledge here, or knowing God, it's a word that means a personalized experience, personal involvement, or personal familiarity. It is the word gnosko. It means far more than intellectual knowledge. It means far more than theological knowledge. You can just look at Paul the Apostle. This, this dude, before he was Paul the Apostle, knew a lot already. He knew Greco-Roman culture. He knew several languages. He knew theology. He could debate and converse with rabbis. He knew secular philosophy so he could stand on the Areopagus in Athens and freely quote their authors Brilliant, knowledgeable man. But nothing, nothing in Paul's mind compared 
to knowing Christ. That's why he calls it, look at what he calls it. He doesn't say just knowledge, but I've counted all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge. The word excellence means surpassing worth, inestimable value. It is excellent knowledge. It is more valuable than JFK's golf clubs or Napoleon's toothbrush. It is an excellence of knowledge. And notice how he refers to the Lord. He didn't call him uh, Christ the Lord or our Lord, but what? My Lord. That's personal. You know, some people like to talk. You can, it, it's like a dead giveaway that they don't know the Lord. Oh, yes, you know that big guy in the sky, the good Lord. Well, the good Lord, is he your good Lord? Paul calls him personally my Lord. Question, how do you get to know God? I like to answer it this way. How did you get to know your parents? You had to be born, right? Officially, you met your parents the day you were born. You don't remember it. You were too young, but it happened. Okay, so you got to know your parents, first of all, by being born. You get to know God by being born again. Jesus said, you must be born again. And so our first birth was physical, and it brought life. Our second birth is spiritual. It brings salvation, and this is what enables you to know God, the new birth. And so the first benefit is knowledge, the knowledge of Christ. Second benefit is position. We have position. Verse 9, uh, Paul says, and be found in him. Now stop right there. One of Paul's favorite things to do in his writings is to describe Christian believers as people who are in Christ. That's how he describes us. Which makes Christians unique from all other belief systems. Because uh, a Buddhist never speaks of being in Buddha. You'll never hear a Buddhist say that. I am in Buddha. You'll never hear a Muslim say they are in Muhammad. You'll never say a, see, or hear a, a Hindu say I am in Vishnu or in Shiva or in Ganesha or any of the other 330 million gods they believe in. If you were in all of them, you'd be disintegrated, I suppose. But we are in Christ. 87 times the New Testament says we are in Christ. What does that mean? We're united to him in his life, his death, his resurrection. His life is in us. Galatians 2.20, Paul describes it by saying, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. That's, that's him describing what it is to be in Christ. But let's drill down a little further. Let's make it a little more practical. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means this, that when God looks at you, when you are before God, you are identified with Jesus Christ. Let me illustrate it. When you get into your car, if I were to follow you to the parking lot, when you get into your car, when I look at you, I see your car. I might see you through the windshield if it's not too tinted. You're in it, but I, I, I see the car. You're in that car. If you then drive home and step into your house, you might wave at me through the kitchen window, but when I look at you, I see the home, the edifice that you are now in. If you decide to travel to another city and get in an airplane and fly away, I look up in the sky, you're up there, but I see the plane. So to be in Christ means this. When God looks at you now, he sees Christ. He sees Christ. He no longer sees your imperfections, your failures, and your sins. He sees the Savior who died for them. So you can't go 60 miles an hour on your own, but in a car you can. You can't fly through the air at 500 miles an hour, but in a plane you can. You can't get to heaven by yourself, but in Christ you can. You are in Christ. That position is a monumental benefit. 
So we have knowledge, we know God, we have position, we're in Christ. A third benefit is righteousness. Verse 9, he says, be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Now, he talked about how he worked hard for his own righteousness in previous verses. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that, that is that righteousness, which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. The happiest day of Paul's life is when he stopped trying to be righteous and believed that he was righteous because he was in Christ. It's like he's been panting hard his whole life trying to work for it. And he realized, I'm accepted. I've been given a righteousness. God has made me that way. Now, the word righteousness, would you agree, is a pretty important Bible word, right? It's used a lot in the scriptures. The New Testament uses that word a lot. And let me tell you what it means. Righteousness is the word dikaiosune, which means to have right standing before God or to be right with God. Righteousness is being right with God, having a right standing or being accepted by God. Now, think of it. Paul spent his whole adult life trying to manufacture a righteousness before God. How? By externals, by rituals, by works. We read the list already. He tried to get right with God by keeping the rules. He tried to get right with God by leaning on his religious heritage. He tried to get right with God by practicing legalism as a Jewish Pharisee. And he failed. And the day he discovered that failure was the happiest day of his life because he found that true righteousness can't be produced. True righteousness must be provided. He tried to produce it. He tried to manufacture it. And the Damascus Road experience, that whole experience made him realize, I can't produce it, but it has been provided for me. Uh, there's this cool little thing that's been going on since the 1990s in malls across America called Build a Bear. Have you seen the Build a Bear workshop, Build a Bear experience? Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a great idea. But the thought behind it, and they put out 160 million of these things, so it's pretty successful. But the idea is simply forget somebody else's idea of what a teddy bear ought to be. Make your own. Size, ears, eyes, look, skin. You can even get away from the teddy bear, get a Pokemon figure if you want, or a Star Wars figure if you want. You build your own bear. It's incredibly a genius idea. But when it comes to spiritual matters, I have discovered the world is absolutely fixated on this approach with God. It's a build-a-bear approach. It's build your own way to God approach. Build your own road to heaven. Build your own righteousness. Well, you know, I picture God as, and my idea is, and I have always thought if I try and I do, and this happens, that I'll get to heaven. It's a build-a-bear approach. The problem is, it's an unattainable goal. You can build a bear in a mall, that's attainable. But this is an unattainable goal because true righteousness is not by working, it's not by determination, it's by, here's a word, imputation. I'm not just trying to throw out big words, that's an important word. Four times in Romans 4, it says, a righteousness has been imputed to you. It means accounted or accredited to you. It's like Abraham. Abraham, it says, believed God and God accounted or imputed it to him as righteousness. Righteousness does not come then by determination, but by imputation. That's the idea in verse 9. A righteousness which is from God, that's provided, by faith. What did you do? Believed. It's from God by faith. It was imputed to you. It was credited to your account. So this is how it works. Jesus Christ has a perfect record. He never sinned. I have an imperfect record. I've sinned a lot. 
Biblical righteousness is when God takes Jesus Christ's perfect record and superimposes it over my imperfect life. I'm in Christ. He sees me. He sees Christ. His righteousness given to me. This is what the Bible sees as the great exchange. One of the most important verses of Scripture, one of the most important truths you will ever know is 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. My translation, God treated Jesus Christ like you deserve to be treated so that he could treat you like Jesus Christ deserves to be treated. That's the great exchange. This is why I never ask God to give me what I deserve. Ever, ever, ever. I would never boast, say, God, you've watched my life. It's been pretty good. Give me what I deserve. Boy, do you like lightning strikes? You better run away from that. I never ask God to give me what I deserve, but rather give me what Jesus deserves. If I'm in Christ, if I've been given his righteousness, then I never ask God to give me what I deserve. Grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. If you start thinking, well, let me tell you what I deserve, you better consult the prophet Isaiah, who said in chapter 64, verse 4, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Next time you boast, remember that verse. If you try to wear your own righteousness, you will be poorly clothed before God. G. Campbell Morgan, one of the expositors and commentators I have long enjoyed, said, there's a greater chance for the man or there's a greater chance for the non-believer who has not heard the gospel than the man who has become an evangelized non-believer. Powerful words. There are people, Morgan says, who come to churches week after week after week and they're evangelized, but they're non-believers. They've never personalized it. They've just heard it, heard it, heard it. And they are inoculated with a mild form of Christianity so as to be immune from the real thing. Listen, the worst form of badness is human goodness when used as a substitute for true righteousness. That's the worst form of badness, human goodness, that is used as a substitute for righteousness. And why is that? Why is that the worst form of badness? Because it's the highest insult you could ever give God. You are telling God, you are saying, in effect, your son didn't do enough. He died on a cross, and he said it is finished, but let me add to that. I think he needs a little help to finish the job. That's an insult to the whole redemptive plan of God. So, seeing this as a benefit, we have knowledge. We know him personally. We're in him. We're in Christ, position and righteousness. He's given it to us. There's a fourth benefit, gets better. We have fellowship. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now, I hope, hope you're catching this. I hope you're at this point going, well, didn't he already say knowledge was a benefit? Now he's asking for it. He said, I know God. I know God personally. Oh, God, I want to know you. Well, Paul, are you confused? Has a prison time gotten to you a little bit? Because you, you said you had it, now you're asking for it. Well, yes, he already listed knowledge as a benefit, but he wants you to know that's still his heart cry. I want to know him more and more and more. What I love is this. Paul never came to a place where he felt, I've had enough of God. I mean, here's a guy, he's walked with the Lord 30 years, he's established churches, he's like Mr. Bold, Mr. Unafraid, Mr. Joyful, and he never, ever came to a place where he said, you know, I've had enough of God. 
I don't want to go overboard. I don't want to be some religious fanatic and get too much into this thing and not be normal any longer. Paul is saying the most normal thing to do is to walk in fellowship with this God more and more and more. The Amplified Bible renders it this way. My determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may be progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. So get this, the initial saving knowledge of Christ becomes his lifelong pursuit. I want to know him. Now, he doesn't just say, I want to know him. He longs for a fellowship that includes both dynamic experiences as well as difficult ones. Unpack it a little bit. Look down at your Bible and you'll notice what he's asking for, what he's longing for is a personal fellowship. He says, that I may know him. That's personal again. He never wanted a secondhand experience with God. He was never, well, you know, my parents believe in this stuff. I think that's good enough. Or my sister or my wife, she's really into this. Or, Or my brother. He wanted it firsthand, that I may know him. Also, what he longed for was a powerful fellowship. He says, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. We know what that means. It means the power to live a victorious life, the power to live above the norm by the grace and help of God, the Holy Spirit, uh, the power to say no to sin and conquer sinful habits, the power of his resurrection. And he also wanted, get this, a painful fellowship. He longed for fellowship in the most painful times. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. So what he is saying, I believe, is this. I want to walk through life's best times and life's worst times in fellowship with Jesus Christ. That's what I want. Because all the sufferings Paul experienced drove him deeper in fellowship with Jesus. And here's why. Because Jesus, his companion in suffering, suffered more than he ever would. Understood suffering. This Jesus that is with him in fellowship was the guy who was despised, mocked, spat on, and crucified. And he is sharing that life experience with Paul. Paul recognizes that. The fellowship of his sufferings being conformed even to his death. I know a lot of us don't like the idea of suffering or we would love to see that suffering is out of God's will. The problem is we do it so much. And I know you want a trouble-free life, but the trouble-free life is the shallow life. If you live a trouble-free life, please never counsel somebody who has suffered because you'll never get it. But when you've walked through the valley of the shadow of death, those people will be all around you asking for prayer and advice and help. Sorrow turns out to be one of life's greatest fellowship enhancers. If I were to take this microphone and walk down the aisles and we had time and you said, yeah, I'm suffering, I've been suffering, or I went through a period of difficulty, you would probably also be the one to say, but during that time, Jesus became so real to me. It was was such an intimacy that I experienced during that time of difficulty that I never had in the lighter times of life. I bet that would be the testimony that you would bring. I've heard it time and time again. One of my favorite poems is by Robert Browning. Very simple. He said, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chattered all the way, but made me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow and never a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her as sorrow walked with me. Sorrow will walk with you, but Jesus will walk with you through the sorrow. That's the fellowship of his suffering that Paul is speaking about. And you'll know him better. So these are all in the benefit category. These are all in the asset category. The things that Paul said, these were loss. These were to be marginalized. Now he says these are actually in the asset column. They're gain. Knowledge, position, righteousness, and fellowship. 
And there's a final one, a fifth one. I look at this as the ultimate one. And that is glory. Glory, verse 11. Paul continues his long rambling sentence. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now don't misunderstand that verse. He's not doubting that he can't get there. He's not saying, man, I'm working really hard. I just hope I can attain that. I hope I can earn that. Because that would defy everything he's just said, right? About being given righteousness. So this isn't Paul doubting. This is Paul being humble. He's simply expressing it in humility. He is stating his unworthiness, which amazes me that Paul never lost his sense of unworthiness. It smattered throughout all his writings. 1 Corinthians 15, he writes, I am the least of all the apostles. Ephesians chapter 3, he writes, I am the very least of all the saints. So he is being very humble, but expressing confidence and stating this as a benefit that there will be for me, Paul, and for all believers, a resurrection in glory. If I may attain from the resurrection of the dead. Now, I don't have time to go into the physical resurrection of believers. We've done that before. Can I just say, please go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he belabors the point. But uh, do this, just so you kind of get the, uh, the importance of this. Just, just grab your arm for a moment and feel the skin, your flesh, your physical body or your face. Grab it. Do you feel that? It's that physical body, that physical body that will one day be resurrected to life even after death. We believe in a literal, physical resurrection from the dead. It's going to happen at an event called the rapture of the church. Now, some of you are not excited about that. Last service, I had a few people clap for that, and a whole lot of people going, like, in horror. I have to live with this body forever? Look at it. It's got wrinkles. Or it's overweight. Or I've lost my hair. That's a punishment, not a reward. Well... I'll answer that just by saying, if you go to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, you know what, though? It's sort of like a seed and a flower. The flower comes from the seed. The seed and the flower share the same DNA. But if you look at the seed and you look at the flower, they're very different looking. So Paul is saying, your body right now is like that ugly seed. No offense, but that's what it's like (laughs) in comparison to the beautiful flower that represents your glorious resurrected body. So when you say, well, how's my, how am I going to look resurrected? Answer, better. <laughs> okay? Better. And you might think, well, I look pretty good now. <laughs> you wish. <laughs> Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 15, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed. I heard of a church that put that little verse over the nursery where all the babies are. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed. (laughs) That's out of context. What he means is resurrection. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised. That's resurrection. Imperishable. And we will all be changed changed physically, a metamorphosis. For that perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. So this is your eventual benefit. This is the ultimate benefit. This is the believer's death benefit. You know, we we belong to the greatest company, the greatest organization in the world. Our retirement package is out of this world, literally. It's in glory, it's in heaven. So as you are making choices in life, remember the fly and the flypaper. One side is just a temporary stop off. The other side is permanent death. It matters a lot to that fly which side he chooses to land on. Make your choices with that in mind. I never want to get stuck. I want to have the freedom to soar with these benefits. 
Our Father, we thank you for the clarity of Paul in his writings. How that this man could mull over these concepts while in prison. Giving his testimony, saying, I used to think certain things were so important and so precious. But I've learned to count differently. And what I used to think was in the negative loss column, it's in the asset column, not a deficit. And these things listed, knowing Jesus personally, a benefit. Being in Christ, a benefit. Being given a righteousness that we could never earn, a benefit. Having fellowship in good times and bad times with the suffering one, Jesus himself, a benefit. And resurrection from the dead, the ultimate death benefit. Lord, thank you for these. And I just want to pray for anyone who may have been clinging to their own righteousness, their own background, their own religion, their own education. Lord, I pray that they too, like this great man, Paul, would feel so exhausted by it and so unworthy even though they have worked hard at their status in life, religious or otherwise, and would come, as Jesus said, poor in spirit, spiritually poverty-stricken. When standing before perfection, we can only see our imperfection. And to think that you are willing to superimpose the perfection of Jesus over our imperfect lives is staggering. But helps us realize, ah, that was the reason for the cross. So that could happen. So Lord, our, our celebration isn't some subjective, we feel good now, so we're going to sing or cheer. But it's something that is objective that you did for us in time, in space, that is real, from which we can derive these incredible benefits. But I pray for anyone who's been trusting in themselves and not in you, who's been resting in their work and not yours. I pray that they will come to a place of saying no to that and yes to Jesus by simply coming in simple faith and saying, I, I trust him. I believe in him. I want my sins forgiven. And I believe he can do it. And he alone can do it. I also pray for anyone who has wandered away from you that they will return to you. We're about to close in a song, but if you're here today and that describes any of you and you're willing to surrender your life to Christ, would you just raise your hand in the air right now? Just so I can acknowledge your hand and pray for you. Keep it up for a moment. God bless you, ma'am, right there on my left toward in the middle. Anybody else? Just raise your hand up. Acknowledge your need. Like a person in the ocean who needs a lifeguard, God bless you, toward the back, also on my left. Anyone else? You may have to move it around a little bit so I can see it from this vantage point. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, right up here. Now, right where you're seated, would you just say this? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe Jesus died for me on the cross, shed his blood for my sin, and rose from the grave. I turn from my sin. I turn to my Savior, Jesus. I want to follow him as Lord. Help me. In Jesus' name, amen. It's uplifting to know that the gains of being a believer make up for any momentary affliction. Did this message encourage you in your faith? Tell us about it. Email us at mystory@calvaryabq.org. And just a reminder, you can give financially to this work at calvaryabq.org. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Skip Heitzig of Calvary Church.